Fox News podcast presents Brett Baer's All-Star Panel. America's got to be in the lead if you want to deal with these threats. We're going to lead. The morning is over. The shiva is done. And if you're a conservative, you should be optimistic. You know, my main priority right now is making sure that it delivers for the American people. We have to make our country great again, and I will do that. I think the president gets criticized by people all the time for the stuff he says, by people who ignore what he does. Now, Fox's chief political anchor, Brett Baer. With less than two months until Election Day and extremely tight polling, former President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris came face to face for the first time In the ABC presidential debate, the former president making points on the economy and border security, while Vice President Harris stuck to her talking points on abortion and successfully baited former President Trump on rally attendance and other points. Post-debate criticism focused on the debate moderators, who live fact-checked former President Trump without really doing the same for the vice president real time. The former president told Fox News' Sean Hannity in the spin room this. I was amazed because I really thought they'd be fair. I have to say, CNN a few weeks ago was sort of fair against Biden. But this one was stacked. I figured it would be after watching 100 percent positive coverage of her. But the question still needs to be answered. Will there be a second debate to discuss all this and more? We bring in our panel, chief political correspondent at The Washington Examiner, Byron York, Fox News senior congressional correspondent, Chad Pergram, and Democratic pollster, Carly Cooperman. Uh, Byron, your overall takeaway from the debate and, you know, digesting it, what what do you think the public's seeing and hearing? Yeah, well, there was a moment, actually Trump's best moment was in the last minutes of the debate um, when he goes uh, and talks about how um, Kamala Harris has been the vice president for three and a half years. Why didn't she do all these things that she talks about doing? She had a chance to do them. And, you know, this is not chopped liver. She's the vice president of the United States. Why didn't she do it? And at that moment, a lot of Republicans thought, wow, that's really good. Why didn't Trump say that earlier? Why is it his closing statement? Why wasn't it his opening statement? And I think they were very frustrated by the fact that I think anybody who's watched Trump for a long time sees that. Anytime he's attacked, his plan is to attack back. And it doesn't matter whether it's trivial. It doesn't matter if it's a political opponent or it's a former aide or it's a gold star father. No matter, he's going to hit back. So Harris knew that she could troll him through the night, which she did. And it caused him to get off track and uh, spend a lot of time defending himself about uh, trivial matters. So I think a lot of Republicans saw the debate as a missed opportunity. Last caution would be it generally takes a few days after a debate like this or an event for it to sink in as far as public opinion is concerned. Chad, what's the feeling on Capitol Hill? You know, there's not a lot of politicians who actually answer questions. Um, And former President Trump was answering every question. To Byron's point, the bait that Vice President Harris laid, he he answered first in every, almost every answer. Uh, What's the feeling up there? Well, the thought that we were hearing from some members on the right is that they thought President Trump uh, did a nice job. Uh, They thought that the moderators, uh, you know, kind of loaded the deck against him. You know, you expect those types of criticisms here. On the Democratic side, uh, you know, Cory Booker, the Democratic senator from New Jersey, he was asked whether or not uh, they would need a second debate. And he said need. In other words, he thought that uh, Vice President Harris had accomplished what she set out to do. Tim Kaine, the Democratic senator from uh, Virginia, indicated that he thought that this would definitely move the needle in uh, favor in the direction of Vice President Harris. Uh, Certainly in Virginia, you know, that's a state that some people, depending on who you talk to, think is in play. So that's the the general reaction right now. And I'll tell you the one thing that, that didn't come up too much last night directly, but it came up indirectly when they were talking about immigration and the border, is the presence of the former president on the debate in the House of Representatives on a bill to avoid a government shutdown and uh, an attachment to that bill, which would entail uh, people proving that they are citizens of the United States to vote. Well, House Speaker Mike Johnson 
had to pull that bill off the floor because he does not have the votes among Republicans. And the imprimatur here, and the president, the former president, put this out a couple of days ago, indicating he said uh, there should be a government shutdown unless they demonstrate to me that there is election integrity. And so that kind of has frozen the House of Representatives among Republicans because they don't have the votes to pass that. But that underscores why the border and immigration and those types of issues, election integrity, uh, you know, we'll call it that, is so important to the former president and calls into question, you know, and he raised some issues about what happened in 2020 uh, during the debate last night. Carly, I said last night uh, right afterwards that uh, I thought the vice president was well prepared practiced and clearly had a, a game plan. The question is, and Democrats I've talked to today feel very good about where things were last night. The question is, you know, how much this changes the race, which is essentially tied. And if it's tied, the Electoral College is an uphill battle for her. Yeah, that's exactly right, Brett. And I, I agree with what you said. I think that she came out well prepared. I think she did what she needed to do, uh, you know, Democrats were, you know, nervous to see after the last debate um, with Joe Biden, you know, they needed a nominee that shows that she could stand up to Trump. She actually, you know, was able to go on the offense. She needed to position herself as this agent of change, trying to take this mantle of, of you know, turning away from the years of Trump, even though she's obviously the sitting incumbent um, vice president. And, you know, moreover, she was able to get, under Trump's skin and have him acting um, angry and volatile and 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 all is that all of that is to the good. However, it was a higher risk, high reward moment for her in that if she failed, it would have been bad. And yet, even doing as well as I think she did, I don't know how much it moves the needle because people who already like Trump, their opinions baked in. Maybe that six or seven percent of voters who are undecided. This opened, um, you know, a spot for them to come to her. She's trying to show, you know, she came to uh, the middle and a lot of positions, you know, especially fracking. She called herself a gun owner. She defended private health care. And so, you know, she's trying to reach those voters that are outside of the core Democratic voting bloc. But um, I wouldn't expect to see a huge change in the polls where they are virtually tied right now. Panel, we'll hold it right there. And the question, Byron, is whether... You know, they, they have a second debate. We've offered a second debate uh, on Fox. Um, Brian Fallon, senior advisor to the Harris campaign, um, tweeted right afterwards, that was fun, let's do it again in October. Uh, they've put out a statement that they'd like to do one. The former president saying that's a sign of weakness and maybe he won't do one. You know, who knows what, what the real inside <laughs> baseball is. But one would think that... Uh, We've got a long way to go to November 5th, and they're likely, well, I mean, you're going to have a vice presidential one on October 1st, but one would think there would be something in October. You know, I, I was a little confused, actually, by their reactions. Usually in a debate, the, the side that thinks it didn't do very well wants another debate. And the side that thinks it won says, okay, that's enough. We're happy. Um, so, uh, I mean, there, certainly in the media, in the democratic world, there seems to be kind of a universal feeling that Harris won the debate last night. So does she really want another one? I, I don't know. As far as Trump is concerned, you can never go by what Trump says about, well, should we do a debate or not? Because he is a showman and he wants to build suspense. And for all I know, he has a clear strategy of having another one or not having another one, but he's not going to say that right now. That's just not what he does. And one last tiny little thing, Carly mentioned it. Did we know that Kamala Harris was a gun owner before? I, I didn't. was curious what it is. I don't think we did. I'm not sure I didn't we did. Know it. I don't know. People had talked about in 2019. It did come out at one point, but it wasn't something yeah. that was infused well into the consciousness. Chad, what about um, where things stand, you know, in looking at the races for the House and the Senate? I mean, it's on a razor's edge. And how the presidential race goes really is going to affect a lot of those races in the Senate and the House that are going to determine the balance of power. 
There was one Republican I spoke with who thought that if uh, the former president continued, you know, this type of approach, the way things were going to go, whether or not he was going to win or not, that this, uh, you know, might jeopardize control of the House of Representatives. As you say, it's on a razor's edge. Uh, there was somebody this morning, uh, Austin Scott, the Republican congressman from Georgia, was on Fox Business, and he indicated that he thought if there was going to be a government shutdown, that that definitely would cost Republicans uh, control of the House of Representatives. But the one thing I want to talk about with the House in, in particular, Brett, is that it's onesies and twosies. I mean, I can point to a district in Western Maryland that suddenly is in play that nobody thought. This is a Democratic district. It's an open district. David Trone is retiring after an unsuccessful run for the Senate. If that district is in play, uh, maybe Republicans get that one, but do Democrats capture several districts in New York State? Uh, do, they, uh, do they lose out because the North Carolina delegation goes from 7-7 to about 10-4 uh, probably in favor of the Republicans because of redistricting? I mean, it's really hard to tell to take that macro level presidential uh, event and take it down to the House races unless you're looking at, at individual races, maybe in individual states. Uh, Michigan, there are three Democratic seats in play. Okay, let's say that, uh, you know, Vice President uh, Harris wins Michigan. That probably helps Democrats hold those three seats, which are very vulnerable. Uh, you know, so that's maybe how you have to look at it. It's not so much in terms of, uh, of winning the House or winning the Senate. It's about holding these seats, especially on the Democratic side of the aisle. Do you think, Carly, that, um, that if it's tied, that it's fair to say that Kamala Harris is losing? If nationally, is it, yeah. if it's tied? Yeah. Yeah, well, yes. The way that the battleground states work, the Electoral College is set up in a way that gives an advantage to um, Republicans just by the math. That's how it happens. And so what we've typically seen is that you need the Democratic presidential candidate to win the popular vote by, by four or more points um, in order to translate to a victory. Now, it's obviously not an exact science, um, but to get virtually the same votes as Donald Trump or the popular vote will most likely mean that Donald Trump would win the election. But, you know, we're watching these swing state polls so closely, and they're all virtually within the margin of error. You know, Harris is up in uh, Wisconsin and Michigan. Pennsylvania seems to be virtually tied. And then, um, you know, then you've got states with North Carolina and Georgia and Arizona where maybe there's alternate scenarios in the path for Harris, but it, it these states are all just so close that it's very, very difficult to tell which way it can pan out right now. Yeah, and Byron, the other thing is you look at uh, like these predictors like Nate Silver, I think he's factoring in uh, some of the undercounting traditionally of, of former President Trump and President Trump when he was president uh, in 2016 and 2020 by two or three points, and then you start factoring that into swing states, and that's where you get some of these predictions. Um, but again, th that predictor had Hillary Clinton winning 90% in 2016. Yeah, I think, you know, the Nate Silver thing, he may have created a monster here. It's uh, It has been showing um, Donald Trump with a very high uh, percentage possibility of winning uh, at a time when the polls don't seem to to support that you know that strong a conclusion, one thing I would caution everybody on is Carly was totally right about the national popular uh, vote, but uh, a lot of our state polls just have never been that good. We don't have a whole lot of them, and we go with what we've got, but uh, they they were kind of all over the map in 2016 and 2020 the state polls and of course given the nature of the race the, the state polls in the seven states are the most important and I, I, I'm not sure I would trust any of them to be you know within say two points of being accurate right now so the question is Chad how big uh, does this debate factor in uh, to what we see over the next couple of days. And I, I obviously we'll digest that as we get polls coming in. But previously, debates have not shifted things tremendously. One would think that this one, which was viewed by about 60 million Americans, um, may have a little bit more 
power or punch. Well, you know, that's the, that's the funny thing about debates. Uh, certainly in a close presidential election, it might have an impact to uh, get certain people to the polls or people say, hey, I have to get out and vote right now. Uh, and that could make a difference in an election. But when you've looked at other uh, historic presidential debates, uh, sometimes they have not had as much impact or resonance as you might think. Let's take a look at, uh, you know, President uh, Obama had a pretty bad debate against Mitt Romney in 2012. Guess who won? Barack Obama. Hillary Clinton had a pretty good debate against, uh, uh, you know, former President Trump in 2016. Guess who won there? Okay, uh, President Trump. So you see that sometimes this makes a difference and sometimes it doesn't. But again, in a really close race, it, it's hard to say. That's not to say that we shouldn't emphasize these debates. They, you know, still to this day bring in a tremendous audience and that's something that people have to have to calibrate and think about. But, you know, sometimes I think it's a little bit overstated. You know, you know, what will go down in history as maybe the most impactful debate of all time was the one that we had in June because it marked the end of the political career of President Biden. Which is hard to believe. It was 75 days ago, 76 now, uh, Carly, that we had a different Democratic nominee. It's, it's really wild, but um, I think the one thing that's unique about this debate compared to the others is that when we've gotten to the other debates, at this point, voters know a lot about both candidates. They have feelings set about a lot of candidates, and it's really hard to move the needle. In this case, we had one candidate where 28% of the electorate said that they felt like they needed to know more about her. And so this was Harris's opportunity to define herself I think had it gone poorly, it would have really killed the momentum that she did have with her candidacy. I think it would have really swung things back to Trump, who you know managed to maintain a tight race in the poll, despite the fact that Harris really closed the gap from where Biden was before he dropped out. And for Harris, what we need to see over the next few weeks is if the performance she put on and you know the information she put out, she made an emotional appeal to voters. There wasn't as much substantive policy points. But the question is, you know, did that help people feel like they had more of an idea of who she is and what she's doing? Yeah, Byron, last word. You know, the first question that uh, Vice President Harris was asked was, are the American people better off now than they were four years ago? And her answer, she really didn't get to an answer on that um, because, yeah. you know, the answer really is no, because you look at m most polls, that's how Americans answer it. Um, she didn't answer that. And what I, when I talked to Republicans, most of them expressed this frustration that former President Trump didn't say, wait a second, she didn't answer that question because she can't answer the question because they're not better off. And there was so much low-hanging fruit that they feel like he could have jumped on, uh, that being the biggest. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, he, 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 he didn't do that. Now, I will say, in fairness to Trump, over the course of the debate, the, the point he wanted to make was, when I was the president, the economy was good. And when uh, Harris and Biden came to the White House, the economy turned bad for you. He made that point a lot. But you're right, actually, he, he did miss that opportunity, uh, which was especially interesting because, you know, you've been a debate moderator many times. There, there's kind of a pressure to start off with the most important issue. Yeah. Well, the most important issue is the economy. That's what the debate started on, and that was Trump's strongest issue and Harris's weakest issue. And that really was a time for Trump to make some sort of high-impact impression there. We will see what the fallout is. Uh, panel, thanks so much. Now for a bit of history. Uh, September 11th, 2001. A lot of people remember it very, very well. The U.S. experienced the worst terrorist attack in American history. 23 years ago, President George W. Bush addressed the nation from the Oval Office, declaring none of us, quote, will ever forget this day, yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. President Bush's statement continues to ring true. We will never forget that day. Those that lost their lives and sacrificed to save others and the freedom and justice our country stands for. That'll do it for this week. You can hear more of this series at foxnewspodcast.com or wherever you download podcasts. Make sure to leave a rating and a review. We want to hear from you. For Chad, Carly, and Byron, I'm Brett Baer. We'll see you next time. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts. And Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app.